Hi everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Rajamandri, Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. My email is sriklpm at gmail.com. Today we are going to talk about a very very interesting topic, Stroke and Hemiplegia Part 3, the localization of stroke. Stroke and Hemiplegia Part 3, the localization of stroke. I discussed already in Part 1 the circle of villus. Briefly we have the anterior circulation and the posterior circulation. Posterior circulation is because of the vertebrobasilar territory and anterior circulation is because of the internal carotid artery territory. So now let's see the supply of the various parts of the brain and the various manifestations produced by an individual arterial lesion. So the internal carotid artery gives rise to the middle cerebral artery. So what all happens if the middle cerebral artery is affected? So middle cerebral artery supplies the entire lateral part of the cortex except the medial part which is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery and the posterior part which is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery, the occipital cortex. So the entire lateral cortex is supplied by the middle cerebral artery. It divides into two divisions, superior division and interior, inferior division. Superior division supplies the Broca's area, inferior division supplies the Wernicke's area. Then we have the lenticlostriate arteries coming up from the middle cerebral artery which basically supplies the internal capsule. So when the middle cerebral artery is affected, the stem is affected, both the motor and the sensory part is affected, the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. So when the frontal lobe gets affected, that is the motor area gets affected, person will have hemiparesis on the opposite side. So if left MCA gets affected and the and the motor cortex, the frontal area gets affected, person will develop hemiparesis on the opposite side. Likewise, the parietal lobe, the sensory area is also supplied by the MCA territory and therefore patient will have hemisensory deficit on the opposite side. A very important point, a middle cerebral artery produces a combined motor and sensory deficit. It cannot produce a pure motor hemiplegia or a pure sensory hemisthesia because motor area and sensory area are supplied by the same middle cerebral artery. Unlike internal capsule where the motor area and sensory area are supplied by different vessels and therefore it can result in pure motor hemiplegia or pure hemisensory hemisthesia that is possible only in internal capsule whereas in middle cerebral artery both are affected together hemiplegia and hemisthesia right suppose if an embolus lodges into the superior division of the middle cerebral artery person's Broca's area will get affected when the Broca's area gets affected person is not able to speak fluently speech there are three components one is the understanding the comprehension which goes to the Wernicke's area from the auditory area. So it tries to understand what has he told. From there it goes through the arcuate fasciculus to the Broca's area. So arcuate fasciculus is responsible for transmission of inf information from Wernicke's area to the Broca's area. Broca's area is responsible for the word output fluency. So when the Wernicke's area gets affected, person will have Wernicke's aphasia. He will not be able to understand anything but he keeps on speaking fluently. A fluent but nonsense speech. But if the Broca's area gets affected, person can understand but he cannot speak fluently. So when the superior division of the middle cerebral artery gets affected, the Broca's area gets affected. So person will have hesitant speech word finding difficulty but preserved comprehension. He can understand but he cannot speak. It's a telegraphic speech. Very meaningful speech but telegraphic and non-fluent speech. And these persons know that they are suffering from disease 
and therefore they are depressed frustrated sad and the frontal area we also have the corticospinal tract coming from that area and therefore broca's aphasic patients usually have hemiparesis on the opposite side because the frontal cortex gets affected the corticospinal tract comes from that place and therefore broca's aphasia is usually affected usually associated with hemiparesis suppose an embolus lodges into the inferior division of the middle cerebral artery persons will develop wernicke's aphasia so person cannot understand comprehension is lost but he keeps on speaking it's a fluent but nonsense speech there will be new word formation neologism jargon speech uh, totally non understandable language and these persons who have wernicke's aphasia usually they will not have hemiplegia why because wernicke's area is in the temporal area whereas the corticospinal tract comes from the frontal area and therefore wernicke's aphasic patients usually do not have hemiplegia so these persons talk irrelevantly nonsense speech and they don't have hemiplegia they don't have a uh, motor deficit so bystanders onlookers attendants think that the person is having some psychiatric disorder and they usually land up in psychiatric hospitals because they have a nonsense speech without any pleasure and one is aphasic patients are not aware that they are suffering from the disease because comprehension is lost so they are not depressed they are not frustrated they keep on talking fluently but it's a nonsense speech right speech nature has beautifully divided two important components and has assigned it to two different sides dominant cortex is concerned with speech non dominant concern is concerned with the spatial orientation what is dominant cortex most of the right handers more than 90% of the right handers they have speech areas on the left side what we call it as dominant cortex 10% may have it on the right side and left hand is also more than 60% it is on the left side and 40% may have it on the right side so most of the right handers the speech areas are on the left and even for the left handers most of the time the speech areas are on the left side so dominant cortex is that cortex where the speech centers are situated so in a right handed person when the left cortex gets affected they usually have aphasia so dominant cortex is concerned with speech and non dominant cortex is concerned with the spatial orientation so when the right cortex usually when the right parietal lobe gets affected they would develop hemi neglect left hemi neglect why right parietal lobe usually causes left hemi neglect but why left parietal lobe does not produce right hemi neglect the explanation is that the right parietal lobe controls both the right and the left visual fields or the extra personal space whereas the left parietal lobe controls only the contralateral visual field or the extra personal space so when the left parietal lobe gets affected the right contralateral visual field or extra personal space is lost but this is compensated by the intact right parietal lobe which controls both the right and the left and therefore left parietal lobe lesions usually do not produce right hemi neglect but when the right parietal lobe gets affected both the right and the left extra personal space is affected the right is compensated by the intact left parietal lobe but there's no compensation on the left side so right parietal lobe lesions usually produce hemi neglect so hemi neglect is common with the right parietal lobe lesions how do we test it at the bedside we give a clock and ask them to put all the 12 numbers normally a person with normal vision puts all the 12 numbers equally distributed on the right and the left whereas persons with left hemi neglect will put all the 12 numbers on the right side and completely ignoring the left side so much so that if you pinch their left side they'll ask whose hand you are pinching at extreme form to the extent of denial of the presence of the left side and denial of the illness this is known as anosognosia so right parietal lobe lesions produces unilateral neglect 
again a part of the middle cerebral artery manifestation apraxias apraxias is person's inability to perform a learned motor act they know they have been doing a particular motor act but when the middle cerebral artery gets affected and they develop ap apraxia they have forgotten the pattern of performing a particular movement so apraxia is inability to perform a learned motor act despite motor that means there's no weakness sensory there's no uh, sensory deficit coordination no cerebellar problem comprehension understanding despite all these functions being normal still a person if he is not able to form, perform a learned motor act you call that as an apraxia so inability to perform an act despite motor sensory comprehension and coordination being normal is apraxia basically we have three types of apraxia ideational apraxia idiomotor apraxia limb kinetic apraxia limb kinetic apraxia is to do with the movements of the limbs so common are idiomotor apraxia and ideational apraxia we have these apraxias coming up on the dominant cortex if it gets affected like if the left parietal lobe gets affected they'll have ideational apraxia or idiomotor apraxia but if the right parietal lobe gets affected the spatial orientation is gone so they also develop ap apraxia but that is concerned with the spatial orientation like constructional apraxia or dressing apraxia they're not able to construct or they're not able to dress well they are more of a non-dominant cortex parietal lobe it is because of the spatial orientation but primarily the apraxias are concerned with the dominant parietal lobe that is the left parietal lobe so we have the idiomotor apraxia and ideational apraxia what are these differences between these two we have the parietal lobe and parietofrontal connections parietal lobe is responsible for planning and frontal lobe is responsible for execution of the movement so in idiomotor apraxia the parietofrontal connections are affected in idiomotor apraxia the parietofrontal connections are affected since the planning is affected if a person is asked to imagine and then perform an act they cannot ask him to imagine as if he is brushing his teeth he can't imagine uh, ask him to imagine and, and and perform an act like writing he can't but since the frontal lobe is intact they can perform real with real lifetime objects you give him a brush with paste he is able to brush you give a pen and paper he is able to write so in idiomotor apraxia the parietofrontal connections are affected so planning or imagination of a movement is affected so they cannot mime or imagine and perform but since the frontal lobe is intact they can actually perform the movement with the real lifetime object since they are able to perform with objects with a real lifetime objects activities of daily life daily living are not impaired they are able to brush they are able to take bath and they are able to dress and then go so activities of daily living are not impaired in idiomotor apraxia and luckily idiomotor apraxia is more common so in idiomotor apraxia activities of daily living are not impaired so patients usually do not come up with complaints it is the doctor who examines and then uh, finds out these complaints so idiomotor apraxia activities of daily living are not impaired the second apraxia which is less common is ideational apraxia in ideational apraxia frontal lobe per se is affected so they are not able to perform activities with real lifetime objects even if they perform it it is in, in an incomplete manner the sequential the sequential manner gets affected they cannot perform uh, with the real lifetime objects in a sequential manner for example if you give them a pen and ask them to write they may take the pen but on the paper they may put a, a, the wrong side of the pen or they may not uncap the pen correctly so they may not may be able to do with in, in bits and pieces but not fully in a sequential manner that is ideational apraxia so in ideational apraxia they are not able to perform for, for perform with object with real lifetime objects so activities of daily living are impaired in ideational apraxia very important 
in idiomotor apraxia activities of daily living are not impaired whereas in ideational apraxia activities of daily living are impaired so these are the important uh, uh, manifestations if the middle cerebral artery gets affected if the right side gets affected they'll have unilateral neck death if left side parietal gets affected they'll develop apraxias and then we have the optic radiations going on from the eye to the optic chiasma through the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe. So if the parietal lobe gets affected, they will develop homonymous hemianopia. They are not able to see on the right side. But if the parietal lobe gets affected, especially the inferior part gets affected, what we call as inferior quadrantonopia. The temporal lobe gets affected, the superior part gets affected, they will develop superior quadrantonopia. So homonymous hemianopia, especially superior quadrantonopia, is seen with temporal lobe lesions and inferior quadrantonopia is seen with parietal lobe lesions. And another important component is gaze preference with eyes deviated towards the side of the lesion. So middle cerebral artery supplies the frontal lobe including the frontal eye fields area number 8. We have a very important pathway for horizontal movements known as saccadic pathway that is a horizontal movement pushing the eyes to the opposite side for example i am seeing i am facing the camera someone knocks at the door i immediately turn to the opposite side to see who has come this fast movement is known as saccadic movement this horizontal eye movement a fast movement is known as saccadic movement the pathway for the saccadic movement comes from the front eye fields area number eight descends through the internal capsule crosses at the level of the midbrain pons and goes to the PPRF on the opposite side. Paramedian pontine reticular formation. Paramedian pontine reticular formation is responsible for pulling the eyes towards its side by connecting lateral rectus through 6th nerve and medial rectus on the opposite side to the MLF. So in the front life fields area number 8 is stimulated. It goes and connects with the opposite side PPRF and the eyes are pushed to the opposite side. And therefore, and therefore, if the front life fields area number 8 is affected because of the middle cerebral artery lesion, they cannot push the eyes to the opposite side. So, eyes will be deviated towards the side of lesion, but hemiplegia will be on the opposite side because corticospinal tract descends from the frontal lobe, internal capsule, midbrain pons at the level of the medial oblongator crosses over and goes to the opposite side. So, eyes will be looking to one side and hemiplegia on the opposite side. It is a frontal lobe lesion. So, gaze preference with eyes deviated towards the side of the lesion is the middle cerebral artery lesion. So, <coughs> very common is the middle cerebral artery lesion. The lateral aspect of the cerebral hemisphere are, is affected. They have hemiparesis, hemisensory deficits, Broca's aphasia, especially if the superior division of the MCA is affected, Wernick's aphasia if the inferior division of the MCA is affected, unilateral neck death if the right sided lesions, apraxias with the left sided lesions, homonymous hemianopia and gaze preference with eyes deviated towards the side of the lesion with the frontal eye fields area number 8 is affected. Right. This is the lateral cerebral hemisphere basically supplied by the middle cerebral artery. But the medial aspect of the cerebral hemisphere is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. The medial part of the frontal lobe, we have the leg area, we have the bladder area. So when the anterior cerebral artery gets affected, if there is a lesion, or thrombus or embolus the anterior cerebral artery, the medial part of the frontal lobe gets affected. So we have the leg area there. So persons will have paralysis of the foot and leg with or without paralysis of the arm depending upon the extent of the lesion. So when the anterior cerebral artery gets affected, the leg area on the opposite side gets affected. If both the anterior cerebral artery gets affected, person have will be, have weakness in both the legs and one of the important cerebral causes of paraplegia. Not only will be will there be weakness of the leg, but there can be sensory loss over the leg, cortical sensory loss of the leg, because the leg area is there. So weakness of the leg, cortical sensory loss of the leg. And the bladder area is also there. Persons will have urinary incontinence. The primitive reflexes are also affected uh, if the anterior cerebral artery in anterior cerebral artery lesions. What are these primitive reflexes? Primitive reflexes are the normal reflexes which are present in infancy. But as the brain matures, these primitive reflexes disappear. Uh, 
so if there is a reappearance of these premature of these of these primitive reflexes or non disappearance of these primitive reflexes that means the frontal lobe isn't functioning well so in the anterior cerebral artery lesion there can be a re emergence of the grasp and socking reflexes which are the primitive reflexes it indicates that the frontal lobe the part supplied by the anterior cerebral artery is not functional they will have urinary incontinence and gait apraxia also posterior cerebral artery the two vertebral arteries join together to form basilar artery and divides into the posterior cerebral arteries so posterior cerebral artery basically supplies the midbrain thalamus and the occipital cortex so as it winds around and supplies the occipital cortex the optic radiations are affected persons will have homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing macular sparing is because macular has got a big representation and macula may be supplied not only by posterior cerebral artery but also by middle cerebral artery and therefore usually they'll have macular sparing so it is a homonymous hemianopia they'll have cortical blindness though the vision is seen by the eyes the perception and analysis is done by occipital lobe and they'll have cortical blindness and the posterior cerebral artery not only supplies the midbrain it supplies the thalamus and the temporal lobe and then comes to the occipital lobe and therefore they can have memory loss and then sensory loss because the thalamus gets affected spontaneous pain dysesthesias and choreoathetosis because of the thalamic involvement brain stem as i said the midbrain is primarily supplied by the posterior cerebral artery then it winds around and supplies the occipital cortex so if midbrain is posterior cerebral artery is affected the midbrain gets affected the third and fourth nerves are in the midbrain so when the midbrain gets affected the third nerve gets affected so they will have ipsilateral third nerve palsy and the corticospinal tract gets affected so hemiplegia will be on the opposite side because the corticospinal tract descends in the midbrain pons middle oblongate and then crosses over to the opposite side so they will have ipsilateral third nerve palsy with contralateral hemiplegia like the as I, I was uh, talking about the saccadic movement and I was talking about the middle cerebral artery that is the horizontal movements so horizontal movements pons is responsible for all horizontal movements and midbrain is responsible for vertical movements pons is responsible for horizontal movements and midbrain is responsible for vertical movements the two components of vertical movements are up gaze looking upwards and down gaze looking downwards so up gaze fibers they cross and then descend whereas down gaze fibers descend straight away so if there's an any lesion which impinges on the top of the midbrain the crossing up gaze fibers get affected whereas the down gaze fibers are spared so anything which goes and impinges the top of the midbrain the crossing up gaze fibers get affected like um, thalamic stroke when the midbrain when the thalamic hemorrhage is there it goes and impinges on the top of the midbrain so in thalamic hemorrhage because of the impingement of the top of the midbrain they cannot look upwards they'll be looking downwards likewise perinot syndrome pineal gland tumor goes and affects the top of the midbrain so they cannot look upwards they'll be looking downwards known as abgase palsy likewise hydrocephalus they can't look upwards they'll be looking downwards known as sunset sign so upgaze palsies are common when the rostral part or the top of the midbrain is affected where the crossing upgaze fibers get affected in perinot syndrome uh, the dorsal midbrain uh, do, uh, tumor pineal gland tumor when it affects the top of the midbrain there is not only upgaze palsy there is convergence and retraction nystagmus they have convergence and retraction nystagmus because the superior because the supranuclear vertical immune pathways is affected they get stimulated both are stimulated so convergence both the medial rectus are stimulated so they'll have convergence likewise both the both the superior rectus and the inferior rectus they get stimulated so they'll have retraction nystagmus so you have we have convergence and retraction nystagmus convergence because of the both the medial rectus are simultaneously stimulated because it's a supranuclear vertical eye movement disorder so both are stimulated at the same time like with superior rectus and inferior rectus both are stimulated at the same time so they'll have both the medial rectus convergence superior rectus inferior rectus so they'll have retraction 
there is no divergence because sixth nerve it said is in the pons not in the midbrain and therefore it is not affected and it is supplied by basilar artery not by the posterior cerebral artery the posterior cerebral artery gets affected so they will have third nerve palsy with contralateral hemiplegia abgase palsy convergence and retraction nystagmus the ponto medullary junction especially the pons is supplied by the basilar artery medulla is supplied by the basilar as well as the vertebral arteries so what happens when the ponto medullary junction gets affected we, we know that the third and fourth nerves are in the midbrain five six seven eight are in the pons so seventh nerve gets affected when the seventh nerve gets affected they'll have facial paralysis because all the facial expressions the movement of the facial muscles everything is done by seventh nerve so when the seventh nerve gets affected they'll have facial paralysis fourth third and fourth are the midbrain five six seven eight are in the pons so when the seventh nerve gets affected they'll have facial paralysis when the sixth nerve gets affected sixth nerve supplies the lateral rectus so they'll have paralysis of the abduction of the guy of the eye paralysis of the conjugate gaze I, when i was talking about the middle cerebral artery i said that the saccadic pathway comes from the front life fields area number eight and goes to the pprf on the opposite side so paramedian pontine reticular formation is the center for horizontal gaze it pulls eyes towards its side so the ppr a paramedian pontine reticular formation in the pons gets affected it cannot pull the eyes towards its side so eyes will go towards the opposite side and hemiplegia is also on the opposite side because corticospinal tract descends and crosses at the level of the medulla oblongata and goes to the opposite side so in a pontine lesion there's a paralysis of conjugate gaze eyes are deviated to the opposite side hemiplegia is also on the opposite side so eye is looking towards the side of hemiplegia is a pontine lesion eye is looking to one side and hemiplegia on the opposite side is a frontal lobe lesion so they have paralysis of conjugate gaze they have hemifacial sensory deficit because the fifth nerve is affected fifth nerve is affected they'll have hemifacial sensory de deficit sixth nerve is affected they have paralysis of abduction of the eye seventh nerve is affected they'll have facial paralysis and the sympathetic tract goes bilaterally in the midbrain pons and middle oblongata so when the sympathetic tract gets affected they'll have horner syndrome sympathetic tract is responsible for the dilatation of the pupil so they'll have meiosis they have uh, they have the levator palpebrae the uh, the involuntary part gets affected the mullus muscle gets affected so they'll have the uh, drooping of the eyelid horner syndrome so they'll have meiosis anhydosis loss of setting and the Atosis, drooping of the eyelid. The levator palpebrae superior is supplied by the third nerve, the voluntary part, whereas the mullus muscle, the involuntary part, is supplied by the sympathetic tract. And therefore, ptosis is produced not only by the third nerve, but also by the sympathetic pathway being affected. And then, not only the sympathetic, but the spinothalamic tract also runs across the brainstem, and therefore, if, that, if it gets affected, there will be diminished pain and thermal sense over half the body. The sympathetic tract KR is pain and temperature sensation. So if it gets affected, they'll have pain and temperature sense loss over the opposite side. And ataxia is there because of the uh, cerebellar. We have the fronto ponto cerebellar fibers. Pons is full of the afferent cerebellar fibers, and therefore if, they, if it gets affected, the fronto ponto cerebellar pathway, they have uh, ataxia. Lateral medulla. Very very important. One of the commonly asked questions: Wallenberg syndrome lateral medulla that is the lateral part of the medulla is affected so when the lateral part of the medulla gets affected what happens when the medial part of the medulla gets affected what happens to understand that we should know what are the structures in the brainstem which are present in the medial part of the brainstem and what are the structures which are present in the lateral part of the brainstem to understand this we need to have a small a clue or uh, an acronym structures which are placed medially start with the letter m m for m structures which are placed medially start with the letter m m for m structures which are placed sideways start with the letter s structures which are placed sideways start with the letter s s for s so structures which are placed medially start with the letter m so what are the four structures which are placed medially which are, start with the letter m medial lemniscus that is the posterior column the motor pathway that is the corticospinal pathway mlf medial longitudinal fasciculus and all the motor part of the cranial nerves so all these four structures which are placed medially start with the letter m uh, 
And what are the four structures which are placed sideways which start with the letter S? Spinocerebellar tract, sympathetic tract, spinocerebellar spino tract, sympathetic tract, spinothalamic tract and sensory part of the cranial nerve especially the trigeminal nerve. So sensory tract of the trigeminal nerve especially the fifth nerve, spinothalamic tract, the sympathetic tract and spinocerebellar tracts. If these get affected then the lateral part of the lateral part of the brainstem gets affected. So structures which are placed sideways start with the letter S. So in lateral medullary syndrome where the lateral part of the medulla is affected which is supplied by the predominant by the vertebral artery these four structures get affected. So spinocerebellar fibers get affected they can have ataxia and falling towards the side of the lesion. The sympathetic tract gets affected so they'll have Horner syndrome, meiosis, ptosis, decreased sweating Spinothalamic tract gets affected though they, they have impaired pain and thermal sense over half of the body and if the fifth nerve gets affected they will be have impairment of pain and temperature sense over the face also and since the vestibular connections get affected they will have severe vertigo and nystagmus because eighth nerve is also present in the in the lateral part of the medulla. We have the cranial nerves 3 and 4th in the midbrain 5, 6, 7, 8 in the pons 9, 10, 11, 12 in the medulla oblongata. The cranial nerves which divide 12 into equal parts are placed medially that is 3, 4, 6 and 12. The cranial nerves which do not divide 12 into equal parts are placed laterally. So 8th nerve is also placed laterally. So when the 8th nerve gets affected they will have vertigo and nystagmus. A very important point in lateral medullary syndrome commonly asked question Wallenberg syndrome is whether hemiplegia is present or not. The answer is hemiplegia is not a feature of lateral medullary infarction or Wallenberg syndrome because corticospinal tract as I said the motor tract is placed medially whereas the lateral medullary syndrome the lateral part of the medulla is affected not the medial part. So the corticospinal tract is spared and therefore they have good motor functions there is no weakness so hemiplegia is not a feature of lateral medullary infarction this is Wallenberg syndrome. So if we know the circle of villus and the, all the areas supplied be, by these vessels and what are the manifestations produced when these particular vessels get affected we can place the lesion so anatomic localization in stroke the stroke localization it's a real joy of clinical neurology i really enjoyed giving this lecture and i hope you have also enjoyed listening to my lecture if you have any suggestions or comments kindly post on to my youtube channel uh, I'm also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. This can be bought online on all, from all leading shops including the Amazon. Uh, but please like and subscribe my YouTube channel Dr. Sinuas Medical Concepts and my BPH Dr. Sinuas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.